be seated. Go, go ahead. As Paul and Alicia uh, prepare to come and share with us their testimony, I've asked them to do this. Take the Lord's Supper. It, it's it's really more of a it's it's a it's a it's a, re, a remembrance of Jesus. First century, it was a meal. It was a feast, and in some ways, taking a small piece of bread and drinking a small cup of juice doesn't capture the kind of family meal that took place over Passover, the first century, and. So in order to help us remember that we are a family celebrating something done for us, I, I ask people to share their story. And Paul's going to share, and then Alicia's going to come and share, and then we're going to have the Lord's Supper. You know, what, what unites us as a church is also what divides us. What unites us is what divides us. And if what unites us as a congregation is that we're all 50 or older, then we got a problem because some of us are not 50. And, or if what unites us is we're all 35 or younger, then we got a problem because many of us are older than 35. If what unites us is the kind of clothes we wear on a Sunday or what color of our skin or our jobs or our education, then we got a problem because we're all different in those areas. You know, as a church meets on Sundays, when, when we gather, we're more than just a social club. And we're more than just a religious people. We are a people who share a common experience, a common father and a common savior. And so as we prepare to take the bread and the juice, I, I want to remind us that what unites us is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so Paul is going to share about Jesus, and then Alicia is going to share about Jesus, and then we're all going to share in the meal together. Paul? Well, I've stood before you in, uh, or sat before you in a, a different way, but this is new for me and uh, probably for you, because Pastor Darrell asked me to share about how I came to know Jesus and how He's been at work in our lives for a long, long time. My, my heritage comes from two totally different streams. This stream came from the, the Mennonite world. I had a godly grandmother, a godly grandfather, very faithful, um, that stream. The other stream that came to my life was filled with violence and domestic violence, sexual abuse, alcoholism. And I'm the confluence of those two streams. Uh, my parents were religious, but not Christian. My mom didn't become a Christian until she turned age of 50. But she was religious, so we went to church all the time. And I went, I've been to probably every denomination that there is. And, and, but it didn't carry on, right? It was just Sunday morning at 11, and then... Sunday from 12 on and Monday, Tuesday and the rest of the week, they lived for themselves. But somewhere when I was a young man, young teenager, uh, we were attending a, a, a Baptist church and, and I'm not sure what all was preached, but what I heard by God's grace was the gospel, the good news. That people, all of us had sinned, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. I knew that was true for me, even as a young, young man. And the gospel would be preached that Jesus died on a cross. He paid the price for my sin. Therefore, I was free to have a relationship with God through Jesus. And I believed that. But I didn't go forward because I was kind of shy. And in those days, and among Baptist churches, you know, you had to have a, you had to plant a stake in the ground, right? You, you had to have a time and a place. And, and I didn't, but I believed but I didn't go forward because I was shy, and so then I wasn't sure. So the next time the gospel was preached, in my quietness of my own heart in, in the pew, I went, yep, Lord, I want you. I, I deserve to be, to be sent to hell, but because of you, I'm not. I believed. And then up and down, up and down, up and down. And finally, 
I came to understand that the first time I met it, he, he came into my life. He saved me. And so um, I was baptized, and I, I followed the Lord, went to college, fell in love in, immediately uh, with geology. And, but during those college years, it was up and down, up and down. Sometimes I lived for him. Most of the time I lived for me. And in the fall of 1969, the Lord grabbed a hold of me and said, you need a fish or cut bait. Right? Are you in or are you out? And I, I knew that I was living a double life, a double-minded life. And, and I went to a, a friend, uh, and we prayed at his kitchen table. And while he said, do you want to pray? I said, I can't. I, I, don't know, I, don't, I don't know how to pray. I am in such conflict. Would you pray for me? And in the process of that prayer, the burden was lifted. And I had made up my mind that I would follow Jesus the rest of my life. And I would like to tell you that my Christian life is just nothing but an upward, but I think you know better. I've been up and down, but um, Connie and I have tried to follow the Lord as best as we can. I love geology, went to Mackey School of Mines, was working with a Christian geologist, and then I got this bug from the Lord to go to seminary. So I did, and I just went to be a good Sunday school teacher, and about three months in, I went, I want to be a pastor of a local church for the rest of my life, and that's what I did. We went to the Oregon coast for eight years, and then we went to Alaska, and, um, and that, was, that was kind of far out there. The church had split, and the giving was in the, the dumper, and it was in pretty tough shape, but I felt a call there. I went there. I told Con, who hates cold, by the way. I told Connie that if, if we go, I think it's going to work out, and I think it's maybe going to be a dream come true. But don't worry. If it falls apart, they ask us to leave, we get kicked out, whatever, I promise I'll get you back to America. <laughs> and it proved to be a dream come true, and we stayed there for a total of 24 years. We, and we knew the day of trouble was coming, right? You've had your day of trouble, and if you haven't, you're going to. So we knew the day of trouble was coming, and our day was after 30 years um, that I had been a pastor, and Connie got sick, uh, surgery went bad, and, and put her in a very, very bad place. She was sick for three years. She spent a total of 240 days in the hospital over that period of time. Uh, it was a very dark time. I said goodbye to her several times um, because we didn't think she would she was going to survive, but she did by God's grace. But that started us on a whole nother journey of learning how to trust the Lord. Um, and the day, uh, I have said to my small group, you need to know God now. And, and our small group is younger, but you need to know God now because you don't know when the day of difficulty is coming. You don't know when the day of trouble is coming. So get to know him and walk with him through the hard times. And, and that's what we did with Connie. They were hard. I, I, I was in bad shape. It was a long story. I'll tell you details if you want it. But the bills started rolling in. And we had good insurance, but the bills started rolling in. And so to make a kind of a game out of it, I decided that I would, I would make a mental note of what the biggest bill to date was. And, and one, one explanation of benefits came from, from the, the hospital, and, and they had billed $44,000. And I knew that was the, just a drop in the bucket. But $44,000 uh, was a lot. And then all of a sudden I went, wait a second. It's $441,000. And I keep this. It's from the insurance company. It was a bill for $441,000 paid in full. Yeah. And I keep this over my computer just to remind me of the faithfulness of God. We ran out of Connie's insurance. God took care of us. Uh, we thought probably we were going to lose our house. God took care of us. Um, 
Connie finally, after three years, got better. She's not, she has good days and bad days. Today happens to be a bad day. She's not with us in church today. But God was faithful to us. And, and, and I just want to say that to you. God's faithful. And just get to know him. Because you're probably not faithful. And though maybe you are. But we know he is. Right? And when a hard day came, we had already decided that we were going to follow the Lord. And you need to follow the Lord. And maybe you're in your hard day, or maybe the hard day's in your rearview mirror. Who knows? But the bottom line is, God's faithful. And so I keep this explanation of benefits for $441,000 above my computer, because when the a moment that I might doubt the faithfulness of God, I just look at this piece of paper. And it's also a perfect illustration of what salvation is, because... One line reads, patient owes zero dot zero zero. And isn't that what salvation is? He paid all. He paid the price. How much do you owe? Zero point zero zero. If you're a Christian, Jesus Christ is, is not only died for you, but he went to hell for you. He suffered shame for you your desperation, your damnation, your hell. He experienced it all on your behalf if you just trust him. And yours will read, patient owes zero dot zero zero. That's salvation. Hi, church. So uh, it's a little hard to come up here right after Paul, who's a very trained and wise professional, speaking in front of all of you. But um, so we can put on picture one. All right. All right. Okay. That's all right. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Alicia Chavez, and I actually run a, a mortgage company here in Elko. Um, I've primarily been in Elko the majority of my life, and I'm originally from the Bay Area, but I raised two little boys, Lucas, James, and Alvaro Abraham, and I don't think you can see their picture yet, but I know you're going to be able to soon, um, God willing. Anyways, so uh, Lucas James, he is a third grader, and Alvaro, he is a first grader at Mountain View. And my two little boys, just to brag about them, they are amazing. They're like in all year round sports and all kinds of clubs and um, they're kind for the most part. And um, one thing I really enjoy about them is my sons are believers. They are, um, they're, they're devout. So, all right, I got asked to talk about my story. <clears throat> And in doing that, I knew to be honest with you guys. And my story is, um, it's anything but like this sweet Christian girl story. You know, I, I am a sinner. I am, I've committed adultery. I have committed murder by aborting my, my third child with my husband. Um, I'm divorced. My heart has been broken. Um, I've been publicly humiliated, in which led me uh, straight to depression and uh, loneliness. Um, but one thing I do want to make clear is this whole time from, from day one as my young sons, I've been a believer um, but as we know, there is a difference between someone who's a believer and an actual faithful follower. 
And so as I go into my story, I'm just going to bring up a few turning points in my life that have really, that's really brought me to where I'm at today. So if we had a picture too, but that's okay, we don't. We're get, you know, maybe we'll do them all at the end. So, um, but the first place I'm going to start is actually with my youngest son, Alvaro. He was five days old. And um, he, like, wasn't waking up, and he was really lethargic, like, didn't even, like, he was just like a limp noodle. You couldn't even move him. He wouldn't wake up to eat or do anything. He was just breathing and sleeping. So, obviously, that led us to take him to the ER here in Elko, and we, we were there. The doctor told us, you know, your son's brain is completely swollen, and um, things like this are more permanent and this is going to be a lifetime battle. And uh, we called you a plane so you can go to Utah. And um, as I'm waiting for my plane, I, I was devastated. Anyone who's been in a position with their child and all of those stresses, everything in my world at that point stopped. So I went to the bathroom and I fell to my knees and I started praying and I'm going to tell you guys, this is the first time I started praying in years. I mean, by this point, I had no reason to pray. And I prayed so hard, and I didn't know really what I was praying for. And all I said was, God, I don't know what's going on with him, but you do. And if you heal him, I will bring him to you. I will lead him to you. But please don't take him from me. So, um, and, and I promised him that. So anyways, we get on our plane and we spend three days at the primary children's over in Utah. And by the third day, my husband and I walk out of that hospital so peaceful and joyous and so happy because we had the most perfect, healthy baby boy and uh, nothing was wrong with him. The doctor ultimately said, uh, he probably just had the common cold and didn't want to wake up. <laughs> and uh, I'm telling you guys, the baby that I, that I brought into that ER did not have the common cold. And hopefully you'll be able to see a picture. So um, a few, and uh, actually as I was walking out, one thing as I was so joyous, the biggest thing beaming in my head was uh, my side of that deal and I will never forget my promise. And so that promise weighs very heavy on me because, you know, what's on the other side. So fast forward to a few years later, I am separating from my husband. And he didn't really, he wasn't really interested in a Christian life at that point yet either. And so I started a new relationship with this man who was like, at that point, what I thought, he was, like, so handsome and tall and wealthy and a believer. And just, I mean, I had stars in my eyes for this, for this man. And the reality was is that he was a Jehovah's Witness. And I was told, you know, I can only marry you if, if you're, like, a part of this organization. And I'm like, okay, whatever you need. Of course I'm going to do it. I'm, like, obsessed with you. Duh. Oh, and you're a believer, I need Jesus, because I knew my promise, and so I knew I needed to seek him. And so um, I started the process of becoming a witness. Well, one thing I'm going to say about the JW organization is that they take Bible study very seriously, and they have some really great tactics to help you um, not only, like, understand what you're reading, but really retain and memorize the word. And so during this process, a few things happened to me. Um, one, of the, one of the first things that happened to me was is I um, completely fell in love with the Word of God. And I really started to have an understanding of his character, his consistencies, his expectation. And my relationship with the Lord definitely grew more serious in my own life. And, um, and I 
He was teaching me all kinds of things, from the big things to the small things. And there were some small things that I really wanted to pinpoint to you guys that I felt were important, that I was learning. Um, one of the things is, is in Proverbs 1-7, is the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And one of my favorite things about God is that he is so much smarter than me, and he handles things way better than I ever would. And so I had some learning and growing up to do. Um, so I'm going to give you guys a few key points. One of them is God needs you to be mature. And he clearly states it in James 1.4. The other is to control your tongue which is in many places in the Bible, by the way, but I picked James 1.26. The other is hatred is like murder. There's no difference. And that's in 1 John 3.15. Remember that true love does not hold a list of wrongdoings, and forgiveness is actually the Lord's way, and so is it to love our enemies. And those are some really big things that I have had to learn, um, which is in 1 Corinthians 13. Um, The other is do not cause people to go against each other. It's in, um, well, I'm so sorry, guys. It's in Colossians 3.8 and Galatians. But uh, gossiping and causing strife and disincisions within each other, within a church, within a new group is not the Lord's way either, no matter how right you think you are. Um, And if you have it, pay for it. That's in Proverbs 3.27. I did want to touch on tithing. It's really important, but I'm not going to go deep into it. It's another topic. Um, And to control your emotions. It's really important for any elder that we have and any expectation as a teacher, the Lord's ways is to really for us to control our emotions. And uh, that's also in Galatians 5. So anyways, I'm on. All right. Let's go to picture one. Way to go. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so as I was on this, like, Jesus high, because that's what I'm on, I, um, you know, I'm basically, like, skipping around and telling everyone about Jesus, and anyone who's a new believer who who just gets to know the truth, it's, like, really exciting, and you really do want to tell, like, everyone, and that's where I was at in life, and um, so to make a long story short, my perfect JW boyfriend um, got disfellowshipped from his own congregation, And he ended up cheating on me and and leaving me for dead pretty much for some girl he worked with. And my whole little world fell apart overnight. And um, I instantly became dark and isolated and angry and confused and betrayed. And nothing, nothing could help me. No worldly vacation, not a talk with my mom or my best friend, no drugs, no alcohol. I truly was dead inside. Like, death is pretty much what smelt good to me. And um, for anyone that knows me, I'm, I'm not a depressed person. I, like, don't even feel bad for you. If you told me you're depressed or lonely, I would just be like, get over it, like, We all got problems. That's been my attitude for a long time. Um, No, I really felt those things. And um, the reality of, you know, my life of just being divorced and a single mom and cheated on and rejected and left for the world, those were all really settling. And um, I instantly went from, like, being Paul, like, shouting on the rooftops about Jesus (laughs) To, um, I was more like a David or a Job, and I was like really sinking into sorrow and getting angry with God because there was nothing that could fix my problems. And um, it, uh, it kind of reminds me of going back to Ephesians 6, which is this is a battle of, this is not a battle of flesh and blood because my battles were, were something deeper. So anyways, as I was uh, going through my little tantrum of my life, everything is wrong in my life, um, all I could do was pray. That's all I had. And so I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed, 
And uh, when I wasn't praying, I was in I was in the Word because that was the only thing that brought comfort. I mean, I'm, and I'm telling you guys, when you go through a heartbreak or I don't know disease or things like this, but when you feel like everything is ripped away from you, and it's amazing that the only thing that could give me comfort was was truly the Word. So, um, and in that, God delivered, and He delivered because. You know, every day God showed me his love through my sons and their need for me. And he would show me love when my dad would just give me a hug. Or my mom would just come through and give me the most best advice from such a genuine place from her heart. And um, it just let me know that I know he is a living God. So... He gave me hope when I had none. He showed me love when I was rejected. And um, he gave me a savior and showed me the way. And so we can go to picture three. So because of that, um, I got baptized in July of 2020. And um, here is my baptism. I was baptized in a, in a river in Idaho um, in the middle of the pandemic. So there's a few, we can go through a few pictures uh, that we missed before. So I don't know if you guys saw my, my family, which was on picture one. Oh, that's okay. Okay, all right, so yes, here is my, do we have, um, and then you guys saw the picture of Alvaro, which I know I kind of missed. Do we have the last picture? Okay, right on, nope, this one. Okay, you guys, so there's there's three scriptures that I really wanted to share with you, and I'm going to encourage you all to go into them with me. Um, One of the first one is, is Ruth 1, 16. When I read this scripture, I think of our relationship with the Lord. I think of a relationship between a spouse. Um, I also think of a relationship between you and your children. So I'm going to read this and really try not to bore you guys. But Ruth replied, do not urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will be, and I, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, and be it so ever severally, if even death separates you and me. My favorite is where you go, I will go. The second is this. I'm not going to read, but I want all of you to go here right now, and it is Job 37. Now. Job 37, 38, go there, write it down, read it on your own time. But I'm going to tell you guys, this, these, this, these two shop chapters are so sobering because as I'm throwing my tantrum and I'm so angry with the Lord and I'm so confused reading these, it's like him coming down on you and saying, uh-huh, all right, little girl, you think you know, you think you can question me in, my, in your faith in me. Let me show you what I know and what I do. And you can't even comprehend these things. And these scriptures are about what he does for us in the universe, the galaxies, the creation of man, the love between people. I mean, everything, you, there's no way not one man could ever make this up. And uh, it's, it's showing how almighty he truly is. Job 37 through 38, read them. The last one is absolutely one of my favorites, and this is why I actually have this picture um, up here. It is Deuteronomy 6.6. Deuteronomy 6.6. And the whole point in this scripture, and I'm going to give you guys all a second to go there, Deuteronomy 6.6.
You guys, it is to teach our children. There is, um, they are a gift from God. And I am so undeserving, and I know it. And the biggest miracles in my life is that I'm even a mother. It is up to us to lead them. And he makes it very clear plenty of times in the Bible. But the, this scripture out of this passage is really powerful. And um, what you do, how you treat your children, how you talk to them, how you talk to your spouse, how you even interact with your own parents, they watch everything. And uh, how you handle your relationship with the Lord and how seriously you take that, they also watch. So um, I don't even know how I got blessed to have this picture, but I think my mom took it of my son watching me get baptized. And out of the two, he's the one that needs the example the most. So um, that is my story. And um, I'm really thankful to be a part of this congregation with you guys. So thank you. We all have a story, don't we? We all have a story about how Father chased us down, how he did the impossible in our lives and brought us to himself. If you know Christ as your Savior today, you have a story. And your story, your relationship with Jesus is what makes you a part of the local church. It's not the amount of money you have in your checking account. It's not the degree you have, if you have a degree from school. It's not the size of your home. It's not the kind of car you drive. It's not the language you speak. It's that relationship with Jesus. As we prepare to take the bread and the juice today, we want to remember that the most important thing about us as a local church is our relationship with Jesus. And as you heard Paul and Alicia share their story, one of the questions I have is, do you have a similar story? Now, I said we all have a story. Does your story involve meeting Jesus? Is there a before and an after? Can you remember the day when Jesus revealed himself to you and you recognized that you were a sinner, something was lacking? Do you remember that time, that season in your life when the truth of your separation from God became real and that if you were to die in those days, you would not go to heaven, you would go to another place the Bible calls hell? Do you remember that season in your life when Jesus tracked you down and revealed his love to you? That's an important season. That's an important time in our lives. And we all have that if we know Christ is our Savior. And maybe you can't nail it down like, I remember I was on the side of my bed. It was such and such a day. It was a Thursday at two o'clock in the afternoon and it was raining outside. It was snowing outside. Maybe you can't remember those details, but you remember meeting Jesus, encountering Jesus. And the grace that saves us is the grace that keeps us. And the love that was poured out to you and to me on that time, at that day, at that time, is the same kind of love that carries us day in and day out. What I like about having us share our testimonies is we can all remember, oh yeah, I remember the day when. Or I, I share a similar experience with Alicia or Paul in that what happened to them happened to me. And to hear somebody publicly talk about things that maybe we don't hear often in this setting can be very encouraging. I, too, went through a dark time, like Alicia talked about. Or I, too, remember being under a mountain of bills, like Paul talked about. And I remember the day when in my spirit or in my soul, I saw this statement, patient owes 0.00. That's what unites us as a congregation. That's what fuels us as a church. That's what inspires and motivates us. 
not that we all root for the Packers or the 49ers or not that we all live in Spring Creek or Elko or not that we were all born, born in Nevada and raised in Nevada. No, because there will be lots and lots of differences among us and we don't want to ever let those things rise to the top where we are a church united by this stuff because first and foremost, we are citizens of heaven, not this earth. Our citizenship is in heaven. And as much as we might be loyal to the United States of America, and we recognize that we're citizens of this country, even before that, we're citizens of heaven. And that's what unites us. And that's what fuels us. Your Father is my Father. Your Savior is my Savior. The Spirit that guides and in and inspires you and propels you as the spirit that lives inside of me. And the single most important thing that keeps us together and drives us together as a church is experiencing the love of God. The love of God that Alicia experienced, the love of God that Paul experienced, is the love of God that's being poured out for them day after day after day after day. And it's the same love that satisfies our hearts today. The single most important ingredient in growing in Christ is experiencing his love. Paul says it this way in Ephesians 3. He prays for the Ephesians that they might know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. To know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that they might be filled up to all the fullness of God. It's the experienced love of Jesus that causes us to grow, and it keeps us together. We bring many things to the table as we make decisions, but ultimately the one setting the pace for us, the one leading us, is the one who lives inside of us. His name is Jesus. He makes us one as a church. So as we take the bread and as we take the juice, we are reminded today that what unites us is Jesus. And so I'm going to invite the ushers, if you would, if nobody received the bread and the juice besides me, uh, just to raise your hand and grab a little packet. Okay, everybody got one? <clears throat> All right, so what we're going to do at this point is tear the tab from the top on the bread. Take the bread out if we can. All right, so this is what we're going to do. I want you to take the bread and eat it and then spend a couple of minutes thinking about how Jesus made made or has recently made himself real to you. So just go ahead when you're ready, take the bread. Father, thank you for these stories. Though they're not our stories, in a sense they are our stories. There's a before and after for each of us. We were dead in trespasses and sin. We were alienated. We were separated. We were by nature the children of wrath. And what did you do? You loved us in our sin. You came. In your mercy, you paid the penalty for our sin. In your mercy, you sent your son, Jesus, and in his body, he took upon himself our sin. He bore in his body 
our despair, our adulteries, our abortions. He bore in his body our rebellion, our unforgiveness, our hatred in the heart. He bore in his body every way that we fell short of your perfect standard. Father, thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus. Thank you for his broken body. Jesus, we thank you that you stepped into time and space, became flesh and blood on our behalf. And you did for us what we could not do for ourselves. Father, through the indwelling power of Holy Spirit, help us to better appreciate your love for us. Justice was swallowed up through mercy. You are rich in mercy, the God of mercy. And that mercy is evident in your son's body. And so even though we're not gathered around a large table and we're feasting today, celebrating a Passover kind of meal, with this little piece of bread, we're reminded of your mercy and your love. When Jesus was talking to the disciples about remembering what he was doing as they were taking the Passover, they also took the cup, the juice. So if you'll tear that tab on the opposite side as best you can. <clears throat> the juice represents the blood of Christ. He actually died, and he spilled his blood, a reference to all of the blood sacrifices in the Old Testament, where animal after animal, blood and goat, shed once a year and then on a consistent basis. And the writer of Hebrews tells us that the blood of bulls and goats doesn't do it. It's not the shedding of that blood, but the shedding of the perfect Lamb of God. Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so God looked at the shedding of Christ's blood as the shedding for our sin, the one spotless Lamb of God. And so as you take and drink the juice, as you do, think about how Jesus has made himself real to you in recent days. As you drink the juice, Remember. As the praise team comes to lead us in our closing song today, would you take a moment to think again about a specific way that Father has made his love real to you in recent days. I'm thinking of something that happened this week. When Jesus stepped into time and space and spoke to me through a song. And I want you to share with somebody before this day is over that thing you have in your mind right now. As we talked about remembering the bread and the juice, Jesus' love for us at the cross 2,000 years ago, but that's a love that continues on a daily basis. Jesus doesn't stop loving us just on the day we become Christians. He loves us from that day forward, and he's as real in our lives today as he was on the day we said yes to him. And so with me, would you hold in your mind that most recent encounter you've had with Christ? And if it's not easily coming, ask the Lord to remind you, Lord Jesus, bring to mind a way that you have revealed your love and your provision. 
I missed it maybe. It was in a conversation. It was in a circumstance. It was in an email. It was in something. It was in a dream. It was, it was something that happened and I missed it. Would you bring it to mind? For others of us who are able to hold on to that thing, we know that we know that we know, yes, Jesus, thank you for that. I need to tell somebody about, about that experience. Hold that in your heart as we sing. As we sing. Yeah. 
As we close our service this morning, there might be some here today who need to pray with another. Elders will be here, others that maybe you know and feel comfortable praying with. Please don't leave before you've acted on that impulse maybe to step out of your comfort zone and ask someone to pray with you. I'll be here and be glad to pray with you. Father, thank you for the good things that you're doing in us as a church body. We bear your name, we have your spirit, we'd ask, Father, that you would continue to raise us up to be the people, the men and women, boys and girls, that you've called us to be, rock solid, anchored to your unconditional love. Help us to know your love, Lord Jesus, which surpasses knowledge. Help us to be filled up to all the fullness of God that the sweet-smelling aroma of Jesus, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness, faithfulness and self-control would ooze through us. And Lord, we recognize that it probably won't be consistently because we still stumble and fall and mess up. We still have bad days. But thank you, Father, that you never have a bad day. And so our trust is not so much in our ability to have good days, but in you. You always provide. So Lord, as we leave this place, but never from your presence, continue to call us out to be your people. We ask, Father, in Jesus' name, amen.